Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nishad Rego, and I'm the Policy Advocacy and Communications Manager at JRS Australia. And I will be hosting today's launch event uh, alongside my colleagues. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, this is a Zoom webinar as opposed to a Zoom meeting, so you will only be able to see the speakers on the screen. Uh, please feel free to share comments in the chat um, uh, by making sure you address the comments to panelists and attendees, that way everyone sees comments. And of course, we ask that everyone is courteous and remains focused on the issue of discussion today. Uh, and all of that said, uh, please let us know who you are. We want this to be a uh, foundation for further uh, relationship building and action. Uh, so if you feel comfortable, please do put your name, uh, the First Nations country on which you're calling from, um, and your organization or community in the chat. Uh, we would also like to uh, share today's discussion as widely as possible, so please tweet uh, if you're on Twitter, uh, tweet about the launch using the hashtag a place to call home. And you can also tag the organizations and individuals participating. Uh, their handles should be in the chat. Uh, we have uh, an hour, a tight hour, and we'd like to respect everyone's time. So this is just a, also a reminder to <laughs> panelists to stick to their allotted times. And my colleague Anne will let you know when there's a minute left um, in your speaking times and when time is up. So to, to formally begin the event, I would like to uh, acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, uh, the traditional owners of the land uh, that I call home, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I also want to extend my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. And I invite you once again to share in the chat the country on which you are calling from. Today, we also observe Human Rights Day, and this year's theme is equality, following Article 1 of the uh, UN Declaration on Human Rights, that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And when it comes to homelessness, we know that Aboriginal people make up just 3% of the Australian population, yet are overrepresented in Australia's homeless population at 20%. We also know anecdotally that some of the newest people to arrive in Australia, those seeking our safety and protection, are also overrepresented in Australia's homeless population. However, like is the case with our First Nations communities, their lives and experiences are relatively invisible, both in research and in public discourse. A place to call home, uh, a partnership uh, between the Jesuit Refugee Service and Western Sydney University's Translational Health Research Institute, and generously funded by the Mercy Foundation and Life Without Barriers, addresses a gap in evidence on these experiences for people seeking asylum. And it, it aims to bring uh, light um, uh, to these hidden experiences. And before we get into it, I also want to acknowledge um, the courageous and resilient participants in this research project for their patience, their generosity of time and their knowledge and their commitment to the, the goal of this project. Um, uh, and also uh, to acknowledge the project's advisory group for their, for their support throughout this, this process. And lastly, I want to share sincere apologies from uh, JRS Australia's country director, Tamara Domichel, who's unable to join us today, but sends her gratitude to everyone on this call, participants, panelists, um, and, and all the attendees. Um, in terms of the order of proceedings for today, um, first, my, my colleague Anjali Roberts will present a summary of the findings of the research. Uh, we will then have a uh, panel discussion with our four guests. And finally, we will move to a call to action. Um, so uh, to introduce Anjali briefly, she is um, the policy and research officer at JRS um, and uh, also one of the lead authors of the report. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to, to you, Anjali. Thanks. Thank 
Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Just checking that you can all see me. Great. Before I share the findings of this research, I want to give you some background on two areas to scaffold the next 50 minutes for you. First, refugee status determination. This is the process a person seeking asylum in Australia engages in to ascertain their claim for protection. The RSD involves an application to the Australian government. This is the primary stage. If the application is rejected, the applicant can request a decision be reviewed. If it's rejected a second time, that decision can be reviewed by the federal circuit courts and higher. That's the post review stage. The second thing is homelessness. We used a combination of definitions to understand housing exclusion as inadequacy in any one of, or more of the domains on your screen, security, physical and social domains and homelessness was taken to be inadequacy in the security domain, as well as one or both of the other two. So people experiencing rooflessness, sleeping rough, for example, do not have security of tenure. They don't have adequate physical shelter or privacy in the social domain. Now to the research. We interviewed 14 people at the primary and post review stages of the RSD with equal numbers of women and men. We asked about their housing journeys since applying for protection in Australia, the challenges they faced, the support they wish they'd received, and what they did to feel at home. Based on this, we analysed the data around three themes. Their pathways, including experiences of housing exclusion and homelessness, the impact of the RSD on these, and community and organisation responses to housing exclusion and homelessness. Now to the housing pathways. There were two broad experiences of housing pathways. The first was of participants who arrived before 2015 by sea and were placed in detention, then in motels funded by the Australian government and then found their own housing. The second was of participants like Adam, whose journey you see on your screen, who arrived in 2015 or after in his case 2019 with some savings, stayed with family, friends or in Airbnb, and then moved to secure their housing. His quote illustrates the challenges of rental affordability for a person seeking asylum, which resulted in the housing exclusions. So to the housing exclusions, Most people were experiencing housing exclusion when we interviewed them and all participants had experienced housing exclusions at some point in their journey. Most commonly, housing was limited by income and affordability. So constrained by affordability, participants chose to share accommodation and sacrificed space, privacy, and sometimes safety. So I want to draw your attention to Kathy. She was sharing with a number of men. She, during COVID, she was sexually harassed by one of her housemates. She felt unsafe and lacked privacy, but she didn't have a secure move income and so didn't feel comfortable moving out. Samson and Ansi and their three daughters were sharing a two bedroom flat with another family. Samson and Ansi lacked privacy as a couple the children lacked freedom to play and they all lacked adequate space. Now to experiences of homelessness. The experiences of, of homelessness and being homeless, sleeping on the street or in a car were rare. It was experienced by men who were single and at the post review stage. All of the men who experienced homelessness were living without work rights. So example is Hanif, he was living in a house with three to four other tenants. He would cook and clean the house and their rent would cover his living there. While waiting for a federal circuit court review of his protection claim, he experienced panic attacks, worrying that he might have to leave his daughter behind in Australia as a result of a second negative outcome. As a result of the panic attacks, he was hospitalized 
He was unable to cook and clean for the tenants who were living with him, and so they left. His housing arrangement broke down, and when he came out of hospital, he moved into his car because there was no other accommodation he could afford. So he visited a number of services, and they said, uh, we can't do accommodation, it's very hard, we have no space. When he says, we have no space, he's referring to um, the ineligibility of people seeking asylum to access New South Wales government housing services, except for an emergency stay. Through good luck, Hanif encountered a donor who provided the bond for a private rental. None of the solutions out of homelessness for participants were guaranteed long-term as they did not, did not include financial security and often included a dependence on others. Now to the impacts of the RSD. The RSD process impacts a person's ability to secure safe and sustainable housing in a number of ways. The first is the challenges of finding work as a person seeking asylum. Participants affirmed the reasons in the literature, which range from hesitancy and even exploitation by employers towards people on bridging visas, limited recognition of skills. As Cathy said, we have unlimited work rights, but where are the jobs? The second impact is ineligibility for social security. In very limited circumstances, people seeking asylum may be eligible to access the Status Resolution Support Service Payment, SRSS, if they are unable to work. This income security, in, income insecurity makes it difficult to maintain housing. The ineligibility of social security extended to job seeker and job keeper during COVID-19, where people were not eligible to access the payment, even if they lost work. And as Samson pointed out, paid taxes. The loss of SRSS um, at the post review stage was also a significant impact. Participants were forced to give up scholarships, stop studying and find work. The greatest impact was on people who simply could not work as a result of health conditions. Um, the greatest impact on housing and homelessness in particular was not having the legal right to work. As Hanif said of the community at large, they say, how can you have no work rights? If you have no work, how are you to eat? Who give you the food? They laugh like this. Some people don't believe they even, they say impossible. They ask you to stay in Australia, but they say don't work. So they supply you food, they expenses all. The sixth impact of the RSD is the ineligibility to access New, New South Wales government housing services due to citizenship requirements and income requirements. Finally, the impact of all of those is heightened with the protracted and uncertain nature of the RSD process, which makes it difficult to maintain income and security of housing. So participants at the post review stage who did not have the right to work were largely dependent on others for housing. Those who could not work were entirely dependent on others. Friends and family assisted with one-off or regular payments for phone, transport, and even rent, but this was not sustainable. Participants also appreciated organizations' support with food or financial assistance, but felt embarrassed to take up this assistance. In closing, the findings described in the report have two clear implications. First, the housing pathways of people seeking asylum in Sydney are characterized by instability and uncertainty, driven predominantly by the RSD process. Second, there are clear opportunities for income and housing support already existing to be made available to people seeking asylum. This includes providing all people seeking asylum the legal right to work, ongoing financial assistance to those who cannot work, especially during crises such as COVID-19, Government should also ensure that there is adequate available of availability of housing and homelessness services for people seeking asylum who are experiencing homelessness. Finally, the report also recommends that women who are unable to work and are at risk of domestic and family violence must have ongoing financial assistance to ensure they have a means to leave unsafe situations. Over to you, Nish. Thanks, Anjali, for, for distilling the, these findings, um, which I suppose point to um, uh, multi-layered or different kinds of structural influences on the on the financial and uh, material lives of, of people seeking asylum. And I remember speaking to Adam, uh, you 
mentioned in the presentation. Uh, and he described sharing a room with uh, a person whom he did not know, separated by a curtain in a house with uh, uh, five bedrooms, um, but uh, which was inhabited by 10 people. And, I, and I'll, I'll never forget how he described it. He, he looked at me and said, well, you can't call this a house. It's a, it's a stable. It's a horse stable. It's not a house. Um, and that really, really stayed with me. But um, moving on now to um, our panel discussion, um, I will go straight into introducing briefly all four of our panelists. Their full uh, bios will be put in the chat. Um, first, we have uh, Mariam. Mariam is a refugee leader uh, from Iran on a temporary visa who was forced to leave her home country to find safety for herself and her young son. Uh, second, we have um, Dr. Elizabeth Conroy. Um, Conroy is um, also a co-author of this report and is a senior research fellow at uh, the Translational Health Research Institute at Western Sydney Uni. Um, we also have with us Dr. Eve Lester, who's uh, an Australian uh, Research Council DECRA fellow at the ANU College of Law and a board member of JRS Australia, a long-standing and finally, uh, but, but not least by, by any means, um, Jack de Groot, who is the CEO of the St. Vincent de Paul Society uh, in New South Wales. So um, welcome to all of you and, and thank you for your time today. Um, I'll move into the first question and uh, this is uh, for you, uh, Mariam. Um, uh, I invite you to tell us more about your experience uh, seeking asylum in Australia and in particular uh, about your experiences of finding and maintaining safe and secure housing. Hi, sorry. Oh, hi, Mary. Oh, <laughs> yeah. All good. Hi, everyone. And good morning. Um, yeah, my name is Mariam. And thank you for your invite. Uh, well, to respond to your first question. Well, upon my arrival, I was forcibly detained with my three-year-old son um, without committing any crime, but to seek protection. Um, I felt powerless that I couldn't, couldn't protect my son and myself uh, in the detention center, which was controlled by the security guards. After being detained for about um, three months, I was released into the community on a bridging visa with no work rights and no support to find a place to rent. However, it is a long story. Well, uh, the living conditions were tough um, for me and my son for the first few years, but we survived. We survived through the challenges and I'm sharing my story because my story is one of the thousands um, who were forced to live in the community with no work rights and no support to find a place to live. Well, that's my answer to the question so far. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you, Maria. And thank you, thank you again for joining us. Um, all right, uh, we all know how tough uh, it has been for you and for, for many others. Um, you mentioned not having work rights, and I'm going to now ask uh, Eve um, to talk us through some of the, the key limitations on economic and social rights uh, for people seeking asylum in the Australian community and how these limitations uh, might impact on uh, a person's ability to find safe uh, and secure housing. Thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks, Nish, and thank you very much, Mariam, for uh, for uh, explaining your experience to us because I think it's so critically important that we um, that we hear directly from you. Now, I'm today speaking to you from unceded Wadawurrung country, 
um, in Victoria, and I wanted to acknowledge that before I go on. Um, but uh, look, I think there's, there's, I mean, I will come back to the issue of human rights um, shortly, but my first point is I really want to say how important this report is. It's, it's a really outstanding report and extremely timely. Um, it, it includes some very confronting stories of the living realities of people experiencing homelessness. Um, but I think the most shocking part of it is that this is, this is policy. It's a product of policy. It's planned destitution. It's planned hardship. It's, it's entirely predictable that that these uh, that, that people will experience these kinds of difficulties when you develop policies such as this, and it's entirely preventable. And um, and I think it's particularly unconscionable when we think about this the the psychosocial impact. Obviously, there's there are social and economic impacts, um, but the psychosocial impact is immense. Um, What's really striking as well is that despite the fact that this has been a massive problem for a long time, um, so little of it uh, has been well documented. And so this, this report really is extremely important. Um, so normally, the, the, my next point's really about sovereignty. So normally we associate the claim of sovereignty um, with, with boats. And boat arrivals, and the we think of the 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 John Howard claim of we shall decide who comes here and the circumstances in which they come. But um, but in in many ways, I think planned destitution um, and and of which homelessness is obviously a critical uh, a part of the story. Um, planned destitution is also an assertion of sovereignty, and um, and. So it's important for us to think of it in that way because it's another reason why we need to turn this idea of sovereignty on its head, both legally and politically. Now, um, the reason why homelessness is such a big issue um, in this context is obviously it's deeply human, but it's also one minute very remaining. technical, heavens. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's also very technical. So one of the things to say is that is that within the RSD process, which um, Anjali explained before, there's a point after after the primary decision and the tribunal decision at which a, um, a person's claim is considered to be finally determined, and this, that's despite the fact that people haven't gone on to uh, on, onto the courts. And what happens is that's the trigger for loss of. Um, SRSS, it's the trigger for loss of work rights. And, and that is a very deliberate construction which creates destitution and pushes people out. Um, short bridging visas makes it hard for people to get work. Uh, Childcare, dom domestic and family violence, uh, sexual and gender-based violence are already all massive um, problems. But the key here is that this is a policy. It's a policy that is not accountable. It doesn't end up in the courts. And unlike in other countries, Australia um, is, uh, is the only liberal democracy in the world that does not have a human rights act or um, constitutionally protected human rights. And what that means is that we, uh, the system is entirely dependent on policy and discretion. Uh, I could go on, but the last thing that I will say is that a court, um, a court in the UK dealing with similar, uh, a similar context described, um, uh, described this the policy such as this as starving people out, as effectively trying to push people um, back to their home country. And in the words of, of um, Simon, Lord Justice Simon Brown, impaled on the horns of an intolerable dilemma where they're left with the choice of suffering through a, a, a status determination process or having to return to face the persecution that they were fleeing. 
I can come back to more questions if uh, if you have them, but I'm sorry if I've gone on for too long. Oh, th thank you, Eve, for that, that contextualization. I've, he I've heard it described as uh, deportation by destitution myself. It's pushing people into such an unimaginable daily reality that they choose, so to speak, to return home. Um, Moving on, Elizabeth, um, I want to ask you what you see at, uh, as, at both as an author of this report, but with someone who's researched homelessness quite a bit um, in the past, what some of the key similarities and differences in uh, housing and homelessness experience you see between this group of, of people and between, um, I guess, the mainstream population, for lack of a better, better term. Um, and within that, um, perhaps also the experience of women in these. Sure, thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, Elizabeth calling in today from the Dakindung country on the central coast. Um, thanks very much for having me today. Um, so um, very quickly, um, we don't actually have a lot of, we have very little data um, on this population specifically. Um, and it's actually hard to compare the findings um, in terms of the extent of homelessness and housing exclusion experienced in this group compared to other Australians. I guess one of the best studies to compare um, ours to is the um, Journeys Home data set, which found that um, among low income Australians, around 4% experienced what we would call primary homelessness or that homelessness sleeping rough on the street, not having a roof over your head. And that compares to around 9% to, in terms of what we found. Um, if we broaden that definition out, um, as Anjali described, to include those other forms of crisis, temporary accommodation um, and insecure housing, um, in the journey's home, they found around 27% of low-income Australians fell into that, that category. And again, the ours was much higher. Look, the Journeys Home cohort, that was drawn from a sample of people um, in Australia who all had access to social support. And this is not the case, as we've heard, for people seeking asylum. So um, overall, the... The, the level and extent of homelessness that we found in our study is much greater than what you would find in the general population. The types of homelessness that people experience, this is very similar um, between our study um, and what we would find in other research, um, as are the compromises, compromised decisions that people are making in order to keep a roof over their head. So we would, um, these, these things are similar to what we hear from other groups and we, we see similar experiences of having to move multiple times or accept conditions and housing arrangements that may not be safe or might not meet the needs of, of a family. So really the difference, the key difference is that um, chronic uncertainty and unpredictability that people seeking asylum face um, related to their being involved in the RSD process that affects work rights, that affects um, access to the services and the safety net that they might need. So the conditions that create the risk of homelessness or houselessness are somewhat different when we're talking about this, this group. Poverty is a key driver of homelessness no matter where you look, um, but for people seeking asylum, there are fewer opportunities um, for financial support and financial independence. So I think those would be the main similarities and differences that, that I see. Well, thanks, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, Jack, m moving on to you. Uh, Vinny's has, has long been a, a key provider of services and an advocate in, in I guess, the intersection of um, homelessness uh, work and um, assisting people seeking asylum. Um, 
tell us more about your experiences as an organization in this area uh, and some of the practical and structural challenges that you faced are providing service in this space. Thank you, Nish. I come from standing on um, Gadigal land today of the Aura people and uh, acknowledge also our International Human Rights Day and thanks, Mariam, for your words of lived experience. Um, just a little autobiographically, I, uh, a place to call home is a name for a report. My wife in 1997, I think, completed her Masters in Art Therapy with the same title, which was around how Bosnian and Serbian refugees made home through art therapy uh, in Western Australia. Um, so it's sort of interesting, this concept and fundamental human need for those displaced to make home. And often the conversations around homelessness is actually that concept of not just shelter or accommodation as function but a sense of the security that is home. And I think what Vinnie's does and the St Vincent de Paul Society does throughout uh, the community in response to uh, refugee and asylum seeker communities is sometimes incredibly localised and personal about that desire for home. And some of our members are online today. I've noticed from St Clair and uh, Tom from down in the Illawarra. Um, we have specified a specific uh, asylum seeker conferences up in Maitland and Newcastle solely responding to very practical needs of um, uh, clothing, food, utility bills, etc. And we've been doing that for ever and a day. Um, and then we have the more specialised um, homelessness services and domestic family violence services. Um, so just to put a, another context around um, to add to the study, in Australia, we have 116,000 people each night who are defined as um, homeless, and that's through census material. There are 100,000 asylum seekers in Australia, is my understanding, one way or other, in the process or post the process, but without security of place. And to just realise that probably the asylum seeker community struggling with homelessness will be severely understated within that 116,000 people defined as homeless each night. So going to Elizabeth's point around the 4%, I think probably that 4% isn't counted in the 116,000. Um, and those figures are always conservative numbers. So Vinnie's is always responding um, through our homelessness services. But one of the structural problems that we face, particularly now in New South Wales- You have one minute remaining. COVID, is there is no pathway out. There is no affordable housing. There is no adequate supply of social housing. In New South Wales. Vacancy rates are less than 1% for a person on social security payments in Sydney. But it's the same in Wagga, Dubbo, uh, Lismore. So there's actually a structural problem with the supply of adequate low income housing uh, for people. And people are locked out. And they've been locked out through um, not just lack of supply but also the lack of regularity of employment and security of income that any landholder, owner uh, of a property, would need to consider before um, renting out. So it's not just double, triple um, exclusion points, but a whole lot. Um, and I can give a case study later on of Sarah from uh, Iran who after eight months steps out staying our longest tenancy for housing, so eight months beyond what would normally be a six to nine month tenancy, the only way we could help her through was to actually go through trial protection, emergency accommodation, which is just shows you the desperation that a woman 
with children through domestic and family violence will face if she is then also without place in terms of visa and security of place in Australia, let alone the question of a place to call her. Yeah, it's, it's, thank, thank, thank you, Jack. Um, and uh, I, it's important that you make um, you make reference to that. Um, I, I suppose in this context, meta structural problem of just a, a general adequate supply of, of low income and social housing, um, uh, but of course uh, the lack of eligibility of people seeking asylum for that supply anyway. Um, in that context, um, one of the things that it's really important to remember is that people seeking asylum, like anyone else in this situation, are not without, uh, without agency and not without resilience. And I want to ask you, uh, Mariam, um, how, um, how in your experience or in what you have seen in the community do people seeking asylum who are facing these challenges uh, uh, respond and adapt um, and perhaps even thrive, um, um, yeah, in, in dealing with this? Um, refugees and people seeking asylum, they're going through so much in their lives. Um, they're forced to leave their country, their home, their families, and their loved ones. Um, they're forced to find new ways to survive. It is the challenges that refugees are facing to find safety that makes them strong. I know that um, many people have lost everything they, they had once, but um, they're still very kind, very generous, and um, they're trying to live a normal life um, and give back to the community. Um, for me, personally, it is my son that keeps me going. He's the love of my life and he's the motivation for me to keep going. That's so what so far what I can answer to this question. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Thank, and you, you remind us that, that the family is, is so fundamental um, and that is in many ways part of the loss that, that refugees and people seeking asylum separation from um, um, I remember yeah. speaking I remember speaking to someone from um, a, a refugee diaspora community last year during the height of the, the crisis and he was he was telling me how um, uh, members of the of the community had basically decided to have open houses um, where um, someone would cook a meal and anyone from the their, their food needs catered for um, because there was such there's such financial and material stress that um, there was that need to, to be together. Um, wanted to turn to all four of you now. Um, the 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 recommendations in this report are broad and they focus mainly on uh, systemic changes to, to social policy. Uh, aimed at governments at all levels, starting with the federal government. Um, but I wanted to just build on what I was asking Jack earlier in relation to Minis is, 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 is focus this on civil society. What, what, what is civil society already doing in this space? Um, what more should and could it be doing? And um, what are some of the challenges to more ambitious um, action? And um, perhaps um, Jack, you could also, also mention uh, what the what the Catholic Church and its agencies could be doing, but I'd start with Mariam and um, then go to Elizabeth, Eve, and, and Jack. All right, thank you. Um, well, I'm not a policy expert, but I know that a complete society is a society where no one is in pain similar to human's body. If um, a part of your body is in pain, your whole body is suffering, right? So I think if we have the capacity, we can help each other. For example, 
if I have an extra room, I would give it to someone that doesn't have a place to feel safe. And I think anyone can do that. Um, well, what is suggesting is that um, if we can help each other, we shouldn't hesitate, especially if we know that people need our help. Um, yeah. Thank you. Elizabeth. Um, yeah, I, I think um, Mariam's raised a good point around just being able to help each other. And I think there is actually um, across Australia broad interest in supporting and making a change in this space. Um, I know um, my own, like working with uh, psychologists, that's my background, that there are a lot of psychologists that are keenly interested in making change in this space. So I think harnessing um, that voluntary support is one aspect. Um, I don't think that we should be entirely relying on that because I think one of the things that came through in the report is the need for um, people seeking asylum to have agency and to have independence. And one of the things that the participants talked about was um, having that freedom to, to make decisions, to choose their path in life, to be able to live independently without feeling like um, they're begging and borrowing from everybody else. So um, helping each other out, that's one part of it. But I think, you know, if, if given the RSD process at the moment and the way that it creates so much uncertainty and severely constrains people's ability to have that independence, I think if we as a society are going to agree to that kind of process, then we then we also need to be offering that safety net and support. So we can't take away people's independence if we're not prepared to provide that underlying support. So um, I think that's one thing that we need to be really focused on, on shifting. Um, I think it's one thing to provide food banks and support in that way but people need money to live, to buy things like medications, to, to travel, all of those kinds of things. Um, so the kind of support that we offer really needs to be support that um, provides that financial independence. Um, and I think that civil society can drive that change. I think if we demand it, politicians will, will make different decisions. So we need to agitate. Um, and I think as part of that agitation, we need to be reconsidering how we frame housing. So moving it away from that type of investment approach and reprioritizing it as, as, a, as a human rights issue. Um, and that means changes in a whole range of areas, um, including housing, employment, social support systems, and within the asylum seeker um, setting. Sorry, I just unmuted myself. Um, so thank you for those those comments, both Mariam and Elizabeth. There are a couple of things that I'd like to add. One is um, I heard somebody on the radio yesterday speaking from a mainstream social services organisation talking about how effective um, the government response had been to COVID in addressing poverty and homelessness. And whenever I hear that, I always think, hang on a minute, which bit are you missing? Um, so, so I actually think that we as civil society need to do a lot of work to ensure that mainstream organisations do actually recognise that there was a big gap and a big structural and deliberate gap um, in the response to COVID um, and, uh, and, 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 and push for that recognition across um, uh, other organisations. So that's the first point that I wanted to make. The, um, the next point I wanted to make was about lack of accountability, which I mentioned earlier. And, and, and the problem, and it relates back to what I've just made, the point I've just made, the way in which um, the system operates is that, uh, that uh, people seeking asylum, refugees and people seeking asylum have been 
have been rendered structurally and statistically invisible. And, um, and that's partly about the way in which the RSD process operates, and it's a partly because of the way the policy-based system operates. So we need to insist on a legislative and regulatory framework, um, because that's the way you actually manage to document the impact of what's happening. Obviously, your, the report is fantastic, but, but that's, that's where it needs to go, because at the moment, um, Nish and I have talked about this before, this, this, this idea that, that the, the payments that are made under SRSS now are, are described as an act of grace and, or an ex gratia payment, people um, sometimes uh, know it as. And essentially what that means is it's a gift that carries with it no obligation. And, um, and that's perverse when we have a system that lasts for years and people are stuck in it and they are, as I said before, impaled on the horns of an intolerable dilemma. The next point is, is about um, how will change happen? What can we do individually? Mariam raised this. Do we have a room? Do we have a house? Do we have a flat? Do we have a granny flat? Do we have some way, I think Paul asked the question as well in the chat, um, uh, is there some way in which uh, we can offer, uh, offer support? Um, the ways in which that can happen, um, because Paul asked about whether JRS could facilitate something like that. Um, I think we need, to, we need to think about how we can do it individually and how we can offer this kind of support individually. We might reach out to different organisations to see if they've got somebody who needs support if we don't have uh, direct contact ourselves. But, um, uh, but I think um, the thing that we need to bear in mind is our own initiatives are critically important um, and we mustn't just do it quietly. We must do it in a way where we, we, we do it, we tell our local MP that we're doing it and we tell our local MP why we're doing it. So we're making it very, um, very public and very political um, uh, as we do it because if we, if we, if we just stay quietly, uh, we won't make change. Um, but the, the coming back to whether um, organisations can facilitate this, that may be possible in some situations, but I've been working in this area for more than 30 years and I have never seen civil society organisations like JRS and others under so much pressure, under so much pressure in terms of numbers and in terms of need. So... If you've got a way of, of, of being able to provide that assistance and support that doesn't, uh, doesn't draw heavily on the resources of, of, of organisations that are already strapped, um, please go down that track as well. And my final point, if I may, may I? <laughs> my final point is about the federal government is not going to lead on this and we know that so we need to demand the change we as 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 um, voters need to demand the change and we also need to put enormous pressure on local government um, and also state government to step up because the structural invisibility and the, st the statistical invisibility has been deliberately created by the federal government. And we need to find a range of different ways to unpick that, uh, that mess. That's it for me. Um, Jack? Thanks, Nish. Um, so I think the, the question was for me to go to the church a bit in terms of its role in civil society. But um, let me pick up a bit from Mariam's call to, to action, which is, and this is what civil society should have no um, shyness about, is the fact that we are very good at compassion, at love and practical assistance. Now, JRS has an extraordinary philosophy 
and practice of accompaniment. And this is what civil society doesn't have a monopoly on, but it's actually just really proud and at ease in saying that love, compassion, accompaniment, relational actually matters and is the value set that we run from, as opposed to the transactional one that governments tend to operate from. So one is being true to our, our values and being very practical. Um, Organisations and civil society are very practical. And so whether it's very grassroots, and as Mariam and Eve have just talked about, whether it's the room in your own house, um, it's that very, very practical thing of enabling that to happen in a way that's safe and secure for everyone and brings an outcome. And civil society is good at organising those things. We, we always show up in civil society, but we're not always know how well to speak up. And um, the political process in Australia at the moment, let alone globally, is certainly fractured. But I think we've got to take hope and opportunity from the, the green shoots of the rise of these independents at the moment. Now, these independent women of high achievement who are standing for office throughout um, traditional liberal seats are the sort of individuals who will also get this issue. And so the conversation piece based on the practical action, I think there's an opportunity in an election year for civil society to tell the story and to use the policy settings such as this report from Elizabeth and Eve's contributions today. But it's that credibility of the lived experience of a Mariam and so many others who those women independent political aspirants will resonate with. Um, so I also think the thing that churches uh, and civil society should do, but particularly the churches, we are creatures of institutions. Um, I know that Erin uh, from St Vincent's Hospital is on board. I know the great works that many of the Catholic health sector uh, contribute to asylum seekers in terms of medical assistance. It's actually changing not only the practice, but the practice into research with voice needs to be the challenge. So it's not that we just do gooders. We do gooders with institutional clout and we bring the resources to bear. And it's out of that philosophy, practice, institution, and influence that I think civil society not only continues to act, but has to celebrate its victories. And there are very small victories that sometimes we feel in despair of because we know there's another 100,000 people. But actually, there are extraordinary celebrations each day as people have been released from seven years of detention yesterday. It took far too long but let's celebrate when it does happen and say it is possible, there is hope. Thank you, Jack. There is, there has to be hope. There absolutely has to be hope. We've got no other choice, but um, there are green shoots all around um, as well, absolutely. Look, I just, just to say thank you so much to all of the panelists for your, for your insights and your diversity of perspectives. This is very much um, the start of um, our journey to continue to, to advocate on, on this, I mean, ad advocating for a while, but um, to use this research to build um, uh, new forms of advocacy uh, on, these, on these issues. Um, I'd like to just turn everyone's attention to uh, a short uh, call to action uh, and an invitation to all of you who are attending to get involved uh, um, in future discussions and work on this issue with us. Um, my colleague Jenny has put in a um, Google form in the chat, uh, which lists uh, a couple of ways that you can get involved, whether it be in meeting with us at JRS to unpack the findings and consider advocacy collaboration, whether it be hosting a community conversation in your parish or school or community uh, community group, um, or whether it be interest in assisting a, a family or an individual practically. So I invite you to take a minute to look at the Google form and if you feel comfortable to um, add your, your, um, uh, 
the details and, and if you're interested in any of those those options and we'll be in touch in, in the new year. Um, with that, uh, Jenny's also ma makes the point, the important point that the link to the report and the final summary, uh, uh, the summary findings um, are now on the website and the link is there. So um, please feel free to, to, to share that and try to, try to read it as well. It's a long, long one. Um, uh, but on, on that note, um, yeah, I'd like to close today's launch event. Um, thank everyone for joining us today, um, panelists again, um, and everyone who's collaborated on this, this project. Um, it, it doesn't happen with one organization or one individual. We, we have to work together to do these things. Um, and so thank you. Um, and yeah, on that, we close um, the event.